we needed to address the relationship she had with herself and her feelings and food. She'd feel mm -hmm. negative emotion and she'd want to eat. What we went through, some strategies for how to feel and process emotion, she could just cut out the middleman of food. All I want to do is eat pizza. Is that hunger or is that a craving? We can't get a positive outcome from a negative intention. An experience that feels like a hug rather than a butt kicking. This fitness and life coach knows what she's talking about. She gets weight loss results with a deeper, more strategic approach that isn't talked about enough or probably not even done enough. In this episode, she'll uncover how to coach your emotions for weight loss, fight examples, overcoming high blood pressure and being pre-diabetic, how you're stuck and how to stop, mother's guilt, along with advice for struggling with your body and body image, along many more. Enjoy. And welcome back to the Only Takes One podcast. I'm your host, Annie Gench. Today, we have another exciting guest. and. Her name is Megan Kruger. Hi, Andy. I'm excited to Welcome. be here. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> excited to have you on. So we don't really waffle. We get straight into the healthy habits, if you got that pun to what you do for a living. <laughs> but we'll get straight into things here. My name is Andy Gantz. I'm the host. What we do with the Only Takes One podcast is no matter how perfect your life is or one, one person, one day, one moment from losing it all. So we should be thankful for what we have when we have it. On the flip side, no matter how terrible your life may seem, only one person, one day, one moment from finding the breakthrough to the life always wanted. So as far as starting that, Megan, can you give a brief description of what you do for a living? And then we'll get into your Only Takes One story for yourself. Absolutely. So I'm a fitness and life coach. In essence, what I do is I help my clients get off of the diet and weight gain and loss roller coaster. And fall in love with not only their body, but how they feel in their body and improve their relationship with food. Amazing. Mm -hmm. We'll get more into your favorite clients and your stories and how that impacts people's lives. First, we'll get into your Only Takes One story. Tell us about that. <laughs> it was a doozy. So I had been teaching fitness classes all around town, not earning a lot of money. We could call it low wage. And then I was in a car accident and was unable to show up and teach those classes because I was physically injured. So I went from that to transforming my business and earning the most money that I had up to that point in my life. Awesome. Big turnaround. Let's dive into that low point and how that felt because you were not making that great of a wage and you said you couldn't even work. Yeah. So I wasn't terribly injured, but I was rear-ended and my neck was in really rough shape. And I was not teaching a lot of gentle fitness classes. I was teaching Latin cardio dance, a lot of Zumba fitness. I did teach some, some yoga and some of those things I was able to modify enough to be able to carry on doing. And then I was personal training. And so basically a very physically involved job, right? Hit from behind, taken out, requiring a lot of subs, no money coming in. It was a really scary time. Oof. Okay. So you're in that point and there's an immediate reaction of how am I going to get over this? How am I going to turn this around? There's probably a moment, a time of that, but what, if you could break down to one moment, what was the turning point? So I had been exploring other ways to bring in money and thinking about, okay, am I going to need to go try to get a job somewhere else, et cetera. And a friend of mine had said, no, no, I, I think that you know enough people and you've got a bit of a newsletter list. What you need to actually learn how to do is to market and sell by email so you can bring in some more clients and forget personal training one-on-one. -on -one. You need to start a small group. That way you can see more people within that same hour. You can help more people transform their lives and you can also ultimately bring in more money at the end of the day. Well, I was writing a newsletter, but it was very educational. There really wasn't any selling involved. And for those who know this, marketing and selling are entirely different skill sets from teaching. There are some, of course, connections, but learning how to copyright, if you will, and sell by email was what I needed to do. And this is not a surprise. So on the off chance, one of my mentors hears this, he knows that I did this. Initially, all that I actually did was copy his words <laughs> and send those out in an email. And that was what brought me my first 20 clients. 
So really being in that program, seeing his sample email and basically plagiarizing it, I did change a few things. I have since- I mean, it's called yeah. copywriting, so. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yes, exactly. I, he knows that I did this and he's, he was glad to be a part of my success. But yeah, that was, it changed my life. It allowed me to then see people in that group setting to make a big difference in their lives, but to have money coming in that didn't rely on me, well, for lack of a better word, like being on stage, dancing around. <laughs> and you, was that, you said you did a course with him or did they kind of coach you? Did they take you under their wing or did they just kind of give you some advice and then you ran with it? So later I did sign up for mentorship and a mastermind, but in the beginning it was a digital product. So it was basically download the videos, look at the sample PDFs, et cetera. I think back in the day, they used to also send out a physical paper product that you could read too. But yeah, it was much later that I signed on for more in-depth mentorship. Awesome. So then, it, so then you were making money right away and you were eventually making more than you were making before yes. you actually were in that situation. Yes, I ended up being able to retire most of my group exercise, just keeping a few things that were fun and stimulating and transition to almost exclusively that group program. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a definite blessing in disguise, we can put it as. Because if you didn't have that car accident, where do you think you'd be? Like, where... <laughs> It's entirely possible that I might be one of, you know, I might still be at the major organization here within town teaching group exercise mm -hmm. classes and don't get me wrong i loved doing that but i was certainly capped on how much i could earn and i believe i've been able to help way more people by transitioning to that model so to break down how you unlock that door to that opportunity and that breakthrough one took somebody that believed in you mm -hmm. two they cared enough to help you out to do so and three you took action to do so too, because you believed in yourself. Correct. Yes. And I will say that you were, you absolutely nailed it, that it did almost take that catastrophic situation to force me to change. I was in a dire spot. I didn't have a lot of other alternatives. The options were not looking good. My friend believed in me and I thought, what have I got to lose? Yeah. Awesome. It's beautiful. That's why we talk, talk about these stories, life-changing, and it jolts you into a new life path and you haven't even turned back. No, no. Things have changed along the way, of course, the <laughs> durations of what I've been doing, but yeah, no, more and more lives impacted as I've gone. Yeah. And speaking of lives impacted that have gone, gone on, we'll talk about your favorite client stories and how you were, and only takes one catalyst for other people. Mm -hmm. What's the first one that comes to mind in that regard? Okay. So one of my favorites, and if I have any clients who are listening, I realize that in these stories, often several of you will think I'm talking about you <laughs> because there are many similarities. This particular client had had a physical and received some scary information from her blood work and from her doctor. She was in what was considered a high blood pressure range but not so scarily high that she was going to have to be medicated, but there was certainly the threat of medication. And she was very much also within the range of pre-diabetes, type two diabetes. And so her doctor had said, listen, I'd like to medicate you. I won't on one condition. If you go away, make changes, lose weight. And when, when you return, we do your numbers again, if they are improved, then you won't have to be medicated. But if you come back and they are the same or not improved, you will need to be medicated for both conditions, for the diabetes and also for the high blood pressure. And that was scary enough for her that she had been following me. She had seen some of my things on social media. She reached out and said, I'm, I need to get this under control. And so we did our work together. And she, and so several of my clients have received actual like kudos and congratulations from their physicians when they've gone back, praise and recognition that a lot of people say they will make the change, but don't actually do it. And she is one of those people who did. Yeah. Because in that moment when we, whether it's a scare or even just a resolution and wanting a change, we want to believe that we will do it. We want to believe we can do it. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, you just fall back into your ways. You just have to change your habits. So 
what are some steps and wh- things that you did for that person to make such a b- great change? Like so, what, what are the, like, what are the habits? What's the mindset? What are some things that went into that coaching that you were so pivotal for? Sure. There's, there's just one thing you had said first, and I think this is really important. I hope it's okay that we come back to that. And that's the capability. We are all capable. And that is something that I firmly believe, you know, as human beings, we're just scratching the surface of our potential. So capability, hopefully is not a question. We must know and operate from the belief that we are capable. And will we do what's necessary? That's where the question mark is. So what this client and I needed to figure out together is where was she stumbling and where was she already finding success? She didn't Mm -hmm. mind certain types of exercise. So we built on that. We found what she enjoyed and we were able to build on that. What we noticed though for her is that the biggest factor was that we needed to address the relationship she had with herself and her feelings and food, sort of like a little bit of a triangle there. So she'd feel negative Mm -hmm. emotion and she'd want to eat. And so what we went through were some strategies for how to feel and process emotion so that she could just cut out the middleman of food, which was never actually making her feel better long-term anyway. It was just... Mm -hmm temporarily providing either a distraction or some sort of soothing balm. It'd be a bit like, Mm -hmm. let's say you have extremely chapped lips and you're licking them rather than applying some sort of healing balm. I mean, temporarily you do feel a little bit better when you lick your lips, right? But have you actually solved the problem of your really chapped lips? No. You haven't, right? So we kind of- I almost just licked my lips just (laughs) for that exact reason. And I'm like, (laughs) I can't do it. (laughs) So that was really, really helpful for her. And so what that came down to first too was just, what am I even feeling? Do I know what I'm feeling? I feel this desire to eat. Oh, wow. Okay. I've, I've been going all day. I need to blow off some steam or I'm really sad, or I'm feeling a lot of tension in my body. And so I feel like going to eat a bag of whatever might make me feel better. But no, what's actually going to make me feel better is to sit here for a few minutes and breathe or move around. So asking herself, what am I feeling? Asking the question of, am I hungry? Am I sure I'm hungry? Later on, we got a little bit more nuanced. I teach my clients okay, if you are not hungry for insert whatever your healthy item of choice is, then perhaps you're not actually hungry. Because if we're truly hungry and someone's like, here's an apple, my goodness, we're taking the apple, right? We're truly hungry and someone's like, here's your chicken breast. Not that I'm suggesting you should only eat a chicken breast, but you get the idea, right? If we're feeling Mm -hmm. like, oh, all I want to do is eat pizza, is that hunger or is that a craving? So that's another thing we worked on. We have a guest. We're both dealing with each of our cats at the exact same time. <laughs> my loud one was just meowing during what you were saying. And now he's maybe about to ruin my lighting. Uh, <laughs> okay. And when you say that, I, obviously I agree. It's the cap- We are capable. Mm-hmm. I was just saying people can convince themselves into that mindset to question if that's true. Yeah. And what I think it comes down to with any goal in your life, what it comes down to with any goal, whether it's health, fit, fitness, your career or personal growth, anything in those categories, it comes down to two relationships. One, the relationship with your current self in the present and two, your relationship with your future self in the future. Mm -hmm. And we're all trying to balance the two and thinking you have to balance the two. You really don't have to. It all depends on your standards of living that you want currently and in the future. And then into do you, you probably have some other ones here, I'm guessing. Do, yeah. Or actually, to, to recap, sorry, we should recap the last one. So they went from getting a health scare and needing and potentially needing surgery. Medication. And then medication, sorry, mm-hmm. getting medication. And then they met with you and how long, or we probably shouldn't talk about how long because it doesn't matter about <laughs> how quick it's done. It's more of a healthy lifestyle. And what you did were you were able to, within a time frame, prevent them from going on medications, which could have probably led to more health concerns down the road. For sure. Yes, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. And I really want to give the client almost all of the credit because she did the work, you know, but yeah, her work with me allowed her to see what was possible for her and follow a clear path. 
Cool. Yeah. And what other client stories come to mind? You have another one for us? I do. The other one that immediately is coming to mind is a client who came to work with me knowing that she was not feeling good in her body, not feeling like her best self, just not showing up the way that she wanted to. And dropping some weight was really important to her. Mm -hmm. But what really quickly happened was she realized that what mattered more to her was that she continued to feel better about herself. And that shift, happen really quickly. And it, it often is about five to eight pounds away for people. They start to feel so much better. And she noticed that she was showing up differently at home. And her husband noticed that she was just like, you know, wandering around more with her clothes off. She wasn't mm -hmm. covering up between the bedroom and the bathroom. She was just there, comfortable in kind of, her body. Kind of a side eye as she does it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know for sure about that. but Can't confirm. That was, right? That was really big. The other thing was that she had not felt like a strong person prior to that. And so a few weeks in, she was really noticing like, wow, not only can I do some of these exercises, but of course I'm improving. Um, and then she was starting to look forward to showing up to the exercise to see what she was capable of. Whereas before that, she was not identifying as a person who was strong or a person who exercised or anything like that. So for her, the transformation was in how she saw herself, how she felt within her body, and then also what she believed to be possible for herself going forward. Absolutely. That's awesome. So, so you got the end point of having the conf more confidence around the spouse. Mm -hmm. From what you got from them and what you can share to respect your client, what were kind of the low points with her spouse before that? Like how was that comparison? So we talked about the confidence and whatnot as a whole. But what about in connection with their spouse prior to meeting with you? So I think that she was in a very good relationship, still is, but I think that she felt like she could be more open about, you know, how she was feeling just in general. I think overall, so many things improved for her and also her stress management, because very similar to the prior client, there was some use of food, and in this client's case, also some use of alcohol as well to help offset bad moods, stress, etc. Which, of mm -hmm. course, is creating a pretty vicious cycle. Yeah, so. I can see that. Okay, and talking about spouses, mm -hmm. I'm guessing when it's such a life change that affects them too, and decisions to working with you because it affects what they purchase as far as foods and. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the dynamic and how imperative it is for the spouse to be on board with the changes that you're making? Mm -hmm. And do you also have them in on the initial calls to make sure that they are in support to ensure that they do reach their goals? So I always ask during client consultations, if someone has a spouse or is in a serious relationship, if they have support, it's not impossible to do without support. So a spouse could be sort of the saboteur and it can still happen. Ch changes can still be made. However, it's mm -hmm. certainly easier if the spouse is supportive. I don't invite the spouse to the call unless the spouse is also interested in making changes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I want everything that's said to be, you know, it's a safe space. It's sort of sacred zone, if you will. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay. The clients that come to mind whose spouses were not on board, could you tell us what, what all went into that, how they actually did persevere through a hurdle like that? Not that they're in a bad relationship, but just on that mm -hmm. topic, they weren't in support or weren't believing or weren't taking action to support them. How would you describe that success in those clients? So for a lot of those clients, it comes down to a really open conversation about values and goals. And when someone's looking to make changes to their relationship with food or overall their lifestyle, there are often times when certain things are not purchased or kept in the home anymore. And so I think when 
it's, it's a, for many of my clients, it's a bit like having a conversation to say, you know, I'm choosing not to drink because I don't feel well when I drink. I don't behave in a way that I like when I drink or I don't feel in control. Okay. When someone's able to be open and honest like that, how do we not respect their wishes, right? So if it's mm -hmm. like, I'm choosing not to have chocolate mint ice cream in the freezer because when it's there and I know it's there, then it's very tempting for me. And temporarily, I just want to remove the temptation while I'm building that muscle of, you know, feeling the discomfort of not having it. So that's a conversation. But then also just a frank asking for support. I mean, I think the, the bottom line is when people love us, they do care and they want us to be successful. And I think sometimes people think that they're being helpful if they're bringing a box of desserts home. And if we're able to say, you know, at this time, boxes of desserts is not helpful for me, then usually people will try not to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But honestly, yeah, it's all about temptation. openness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other client stories that come to mind? Or that you want to share? Goodness, there are so many. There are so many. <laughs> or any that you think would be very insightful to people that they wouldn't, or that be, they'd be surprised about. I think. I think the big thing that I had alluded to before is a lot of times when people come to work with someone like me, they are desperate to have the weight come off. All right, because they don't feel good where they are. Um, it's remarkable how quickly we can start to feel better. And we can still be a long distance from our goals, but be feeling better. And I really hope that people will take away from this, that they might be 7, 10, or, or only 14 days away from feeling a lot better. And ultimately, we're all in pursuit of feeling better. Whether we hit that end goal of whether it's 20 pounds, 50 pounds, 100 pounds, if people are feeling better, they're way more likely to stay consistent. And so I think that's the thing. Like, I think a lot of times people will say it's about getting the 20 pounds off. No, it isn't yet. I mean, yeah. Okay. <laughs> First, it's about feeling better when feeling better be, can be as simple as getting a bit more rest, being better hydrated, having better vitamins and minerals, cleaning up your food, even just a few percentage and moving a bit more. I mean, just those things can really create a big impact on how someone feels. Absolutely. The the vibe I'm getting here from you is that you're, you focus a lot on emotions, which is mm -hmm. incredible. And you never hear from enough in the fitness field or the health field. And how would that come to mind? How, what percentage would you say is your coaching on emotions and mental approach or mindset versus actual physical action of diet and, and movement? Okay. So what I would say is that, and it really depends on the client. Mm -hmm. If the client is struggling to execute on strategy, then we know it's mental. Okay. So then we need to dive in there and take a look at what's happening. Is it emotional first or is it thought-based first? And do we need to employ some somatic practices to help release some of that emotion? Do we need to enhance a toolkit for processing emotion or even just becoming aware of what we're feeling? Um, do we need to have a better understanding that we are not our thoughts and sort of dive into some of that as well, being the observer, being able to be back from what... <laughs> Uh, for me, it's like a monkey, what the monkey is running around in my head saying and doing, you know, like mm -hmm. just being aware that I can observe that is so empowering. Um, but so for most clients, they'll think they need strategy. And then what I find out usually within the first few weeks is, is it actually a strategic thing that we, so then now we need to run some experiments to figure out what's the best path for that individual's body to release this extra weight. Or if it's not strategy, and for many it isn't, do we need to start to figure out where the, the obstacles are arising emotionally, mentally? And I'm guessing most all your clients have at least some type of emotional mm -hmm. aspect to it that you coach them on, and probably 100%, I'm guessing. All of them. Yeah, all of them, yeah. for sure. And a lot of it comes down to, so there's different things. There's, am I worthy of investing this time? and energy in myself? Is it selfish? So there's some, for many of them, mom guilt, like related to, 
taking either the time or the money or whatever to put toward themselves and the care for their bodies. For others, it's, I mean, for some, there's even the fear of success, you know, like, what does it mean if I am not the fat friend anymore? I have always been that person. So who am I if I'm not that? Fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Interesting. When people are stuck and like, whether they're your clients or not, when people are stuck, do you think the emotional and strategic aspect is the biggest reason that they don't achieve their goals or they aren't currently? So I think the really tricky thing about stuck is that it is a perspective, right? So when someone thinks I'm stuck and she tells herself I'm stuck, what action is she taking? We're not in a creative place. We're not open to opportunity or intuition or um, experimentation because we believe ourselves to be stuck. So one of the things I teach my clients is, okay, well, I may have seen the same number on the scale for a while, or I might've been in the same size for a while. What if my body is acting? acclimatizing <laughs> or what if I'm simply here and now I get to ask the question of what might it look like to be there what might be involved to get there rather than saying I'm stuck because the truth of it is there's no static or fixed anything I mean we're always in flux so we might seem like we are holding at a certain weight or size or whatever else and one of the worst possible things we can do is to tell ourselves we're stuck. So even if someone True. truly believes I'm stuck, it's like, well, what if you weren't stuck? <laughs> what what would you be doing if you weren't stuck? No what, would, what does the you who weighs insert goal weight or next milestone, what does that you do? What's her day looking like that's different from yours? Just to see if mm -hmm. we can open up possibility. And what you said about the mother's guilt, mm -hmm. which I can't relate to, I can try to put myself in those shoes that when you're responsible for another human that's not developed, it's an inevitable, how could I be doing better? Mm -hmm. So when, and I used to work in the fitness industry, I'm a little bit too healthy in a lot of regards, but when somebody has those, has that thought, if, when you're in a bad or good mood, you're always affecting those around you. Mm -hmm. So it always starts with you. So the investment into yourself and your health and nutrition and getting happier and healthier inevitably positively affects everybody else around you, whether it is your kids, whether it is your spouse, whether it is your friends, whether it is your performance at work. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else on that topic you want to speak about? Well, I think it's also an opportunity to be an example of taking care of yourself. I think that's mm -hmm. something that I had modeled very well for me by my mother she worked out throughout her pregnancy with me and then carried on working out and really was very diligent about letting us know, like, I do this because I feel better when I've done it. And it's very important. So I think there's an opportunity always for moms to show, wow, okay, I, I invest in myself by, you know, either what, whatever it is, getting therapy or coaching or personal training or all of the things, right? I take care mm -hmm. of my well-being. I take time. I think it's important for moms to take time to do hobbies, to show their kids that that's important as well. To have time just, you know, if you enjoy reading, reading a book, have your kids see you reading a book. That's beautiful. It's important. Yep. I mean, by example, mm -hmm. that also leads to us being just like our parents or not mm -hmm. just like in every regard, but we're inevitably like our parents. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that because I that reminds me of my life as a two-year-old. My dad got a membership at Lifetime, one of the first ever mem or memberships. He's a founding member. Mm -hmm. And so ever since I was a kid, I'd go to the child center, see my dad at the club and be around that environment of healthy habits and what it's like to be in a healthy living. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's awesome you said that. All right. In regards to your industry, what are some shocking industry statistics you have for us? All right. So I was, I have some notes here because I want to get this right. Yeah. One of these, it was a little bit, well, both of them actually are a little bit on the discouraging side. So I'll <laughs> share them and then most of Texas are, <laughs> you know, we can, hopefully we can, we can spin this to provide some encouragement. One of the things that I took a look at because I think a lot of times people associate making changes to health with New Year's resolutions. 
And so one of the sort of lousy statistics was that when people set New Year's resolutions, it looks like roughly 9% of these folks keep them for the year and that 80% quit midwinter. So we'd be looking at about now. <laughs> uh, <we're laughs> this year specifically. Yeah, February 6th today. And so that would be about when people are quitting their New Year's resolutions. So those two were a little bit discouraging. Um, yeah, it's... Hearing the number 9% of any group of people is low. Mm-hmm. It does seem higher than I would have thought. So that's kind of positive in that respect. And it did say measuring the entire year, mm-hmm. which is even more reassuring. Was that statistic for the US or Minnesota specifically? I think it was North American based, but I'm North not American. sure. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And then. One of the other things that I looked into, because people will often ask me, what do you consider competition? And I don't look at other health coaches or fitness coaches or life coaches as competition. I see them as like, we are all offering our own beautiful flavor to help with the betterment of humanity. Because when we are feeling well, feeling good within ourselves, we show up better and there's that beautiful trickle down. So what I consider to be more of like competition, if you will, would be like soda and cigarettes and drugs. But additionally, I also look at some of the medical things that are available that are sort of like quicker fixes, if you will, as being less helpful in terms of creating long-term change for people and showing someone what's possible. Because when we set on a mission to drop 20 or 50 pounds, we are becoming the person who can sustain being at that weight. There's a Mm -hmm. real beautiful change, a metamorphosis that happens. So one of the things I looked at was gastric bypass surgery. And depending on the studies, because I saw various different numbers, 50 to 76% of people have a significant weight regain after something like that within five to seven years. And so that was sort of a bummer because I'm thinking, wow, you've been medically altered. You've had to go through quite a serious procedure to have a significant weight gain within five to seven years. And they were categorizing significant as 25% of the weight that was lost or more would be regained. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. A bummer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you make such a drastic change to your body so quickly and even cutting into it Mm -hmm. with surgery, there's just so much that's broken naturally that is incalculable Mm long-term. Whether it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, Mm -hmm. even five years that people, I mean, even if you're rich, like, and you're just like, oh, you hear that statistic every five, seven years, I can afford that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what about (laughs) how long you're going to live if (laughs) that's not sustainable? Right. And like you said before, we are, every single person is capable of making changes to better their lives in whatever category they are focusing on. And in many categories, you just have to believe in yourself, one, and two, find the right resources, such as yourself, (laughs) to guide you through those steps to do it the natural way. And you also mentioned that there, there's a metamorphosis when you can, when you're able to achieve a goal and able to make changes that better your life and everybody around you. And there's even, and that's just basically what the whole, that's even more fulfilling is what I'd say, is actually having the fulfillment of winning in that regard and being able to do it yourself as opposed to the button push quick fix. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any more thoughts on those that you have for us? I think the the biggest thing I would offer is that right now in this the year of 2024, the foods that are available to us in the grocery store, many of them are not conducive to having a healthy weight, having healthy metabolism. So knowing that there does need to be intentionality to have and maintain good health. We have to plan. We have to be thoughtful. We have to be strategic. It's very possible, but things are rigged a bit against the average person right now. We have more food available than you know we have had in years, but so much of it is highly processed, low nutrient, very addictive, and very much leading people into cycles of wanting to eat and eat and eat and eat. With that being said, 
we are remarkably capable and all very much able to make these changes. And I think that once someone is solidly on a path of taking good care of herself, um, it's self-fulfilling. The reward is there. We want to stay doing it. And we can very much drop and keep weight off without having to go the route of weight loss drugs or surgeries or whatever else, which also, I just want to state for the record, if that is necessary for a person, it's beautiful that that's available as an option. And I think that for it to be extremely successful, it has to be paired with change in behavior and with awareness and knowledge about what is actually healthy for my body. What does lead to me feeling good? What doesn't have me wanting to go back for more and more and more? Yeah, those are the first steps or some of the first steps <laughs> in regards to making those changes. So what would you say are some misconceptions about your field? There are definitely a lot. I mean, there's a lot of content on the socials that people can fall into and they're getting the wrong information, but they follow somebody that posts every day. So they're being fed the wrong information or led down a path that's subconsciously attacking sure. their progress. So what, what would you say to have that question first before misconceptions is how would you give in, in such a fire hose capacity of us getting information from social and all these influencers, how, what is your advice to navigate and try to decipher what is true and what you should believe in and what you should put faith in? So one of the methods that I teach my clients is to trust the gut instinct. And if, if gut doesn't resonate for you, for others, it's heart. But usually we will be having a physical yes or no response. And to really try to mm -hmm. honor that. Like, have you ever heard a beautiful piece of music, Andy, and it gives you goosebumps? Yeah. Definitely. Okay, that's definitely. very like that that is in alignment for you, right? Mm -hmm. You think about trying something and you feel excited or maybe get like a tingle or you feel open right? That's in alignment. If you feel a contraction or like a creepy hair on the back of your neck feeling, that's not, that's a no. If something gives you kind of like a, any kind of a no vibe within your body, trust that. So that's something. Then within that too, I think it's, it's really believing that we are all incredibly resourced and we do all have our own inner knowing, right? And asking yourself, okay, like, does my big S self truly jive with this? <laughs> or is it my small S self, right? Because like, I think a lot of people's small S selves wouldn't mind having a million dollar mansion or whatever, a shit ton of money, oops, I swore, sorry, in the bank or, you know, <laughs> like a bunch of stuff that, that sounds really great, but is that actually what you want? Well, okay, the chocolate cake often sounds really great, but is that actually what I want? And if I'm listening to my big ass self, maybe I just want a bite. Or maybe, no, it's good. I'm fine. I don't need any chocolate cake today or next week even. And you're saying big what self? S. Big S. So I, you know, I, I did not come up with this. I cannot. Like Superman remember. or that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> so it's like, like, you know, when you think of your, like your higher self, being the large S, the capital S self, and maybe your ego or your smaller S self being your more primitive drive, maybe more selfish things, more like short-term gratification seeking version of mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Yep. Looking for that easy button. Yeah. So trusting your knowing. I mean, I think it's great also, of course, like check out the credentials of whomever you're following, right? I mean, just because someone looks fantastic doesn't mean they know anything. <laughs> they know what has worked for them and maybe they know what works for others. I think that's helpful too. So knowing that, mm -hmm. you know, whomever you're, you're following either has a very proven track record with many people or... And or lots of credentials. Mm -hmm. And there are many misconceptions in every field, in every industry. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what can also prevent people from actually taking action mm -hmm. to reach what they want to reach, especially with goals, whether it's health and fitness with you. So what are some of the misconceptions about your industry that are not the case at all with you? 
I hear frequently from clients, I thought this would be harder, or I'm surprised how easy it has been. Now, that's awesome. I, I, I say that, <laughs> and I don't want people to think it's only easy because I do mm -hmm. think that there are times when we might really want to order a pizza and we've told ourselves we're not doing it and it's very uncomfortable for 15 minutes or the rest of the evening or whatever it might be, right? So that's not necessarily easy, but that's one thing because when I was coming up in fitness 20 years ago, no pain, no gain was very much a slogan that was being used. I think it's still actually being used, although it's super archaic. We don't mm -hmm. need to have things be awful to see results. And not only physically, like we don't need to go into the weight room and do things and max out and fail and whatever in order to be successful. We don't have to be excruciatingly sore or really suffer or work out until we vomit or never have a dessert again in order to be successful. It doesn't have to be like that. And so I think that's one of the common misconceptions. I think a lot of people don't get started because they are worried that it will be really hard and that they'll never be having fun again. Yeah. The no pain, no gain thing. That's, I think, not saying it's good or bad, but it's just the residuals of being in a capitalistic culture. <laughs> just whatever it takes, just mm -hmm. do that. And it gets too ingrained into our emotions, which eventually affects our emotions in our day to day. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that because I was thinking about a conversation I'd had with a friend as you were saying that about how extractive we are right? How we're always looking to get everything we can from something. And I think many of us have fallen into the habit of being that way with our bodies. We are trying to do minimal amount of sleep, minimal amount of play, if there's any play. It's just like, go, 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 push, push, push. And I think that it's easy to then think, well, surely when we're on a weight journey, we're looking to drop 20 pounds, go, 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 push, push, push is the answer. And actually for most people, it's not, it really isn't. It's been very interesting for me, how many clients we've stopped extremely intense exercise, shifted the levels of intensity and seen the weight starting to come off more easily. Yeah. Cause all of our bodies are different. Yeah. And it's, it can be, I mean, it, is, it can be difficult for people to make that leap and try to work with somebody like a health coach like yourself, because especially if they've never got do, done the right things, they probably tried 14 different diets. They've tried all these different workout plans, but a lot of those diets and workout plans are sent to the public. It's not tailored to you and what works for your body. Right. Um, I had another thought there. <laughs> so when they are working with you and they're trying to do another approach, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, another thing that's not going to work. And then they have to put in more effort down a path that they think they might not, they might get zero return on. That's one of the hardest things in life is to put in all the effort and not see results. Mm -hmm. But obviously with you, they're all these other clients are seeing the results that they want and everybody around them is being happy for happier for it. Yes. I think you hit something on the head there. It is really hard for people to want to take the leap to try something else if they've already been unsuccessful. I come back to, I think about, I don't know, who was it? Was it Bell who created the phone? It was a telephone. Anyway, insert whatever inventor here, right? <laughs> um, whoever invented something that we now mm -hmm. use, how many yeah. efforts and attempts did it take without this person giving up for us to have what we have? When you think about your life and how many years you hope to live, I mean, I would say even if you have two years more that you're hoping to live, isn't it worth it now to feel better for those years to come? Most of the people listening to this will hope for 40 plus more years on their lives is my guess. And so then it's definitely worth it to invest the time and the energy to run another experiment to figure out what's going to work for you. Because once you get to that future point, it's more painful thinking what if mm -hmm. and having that regret as opposed to actually trying it out. And even if it doesn't work, you can <laughs> remove any type of regret from that possibility of happening because it could haunt you forever. Yeah. And I think things are always working. We may not have the result we want yet, but we are, we are figuring things out. We're learning things. 
And like you said, with it takes many attempts and everything, WD-40 is called WD-40 because they tried 39 different combinations of ingredients and components before they found the 40th one yeah. that worked and is arguably a man's man's best friend compared to duct tape <laughs> every quote unquote stereotypical dad loves their wd-40 and their duct tape for sure so i guess you're saying that it only takes one is that is that what your implication <laughs> is <laughs> it was sitting right there i had to say it you had to. <laughs> yeah we're kind of wrapping things up as far as the structure of this for any quick hit advice for people who are struggling with their health and fitness they're um, emotional relationship with themselves in regards to that topic. What are your quick hit words of advice to help those people out? So if someone's struggling with the relationship with their body, one of the the best things I could teach this person to do is to show some gratitude and appreciation for what they have. So this was taught in actually in my life coaching certification and I loved it so much. It was just to ask yourself, you know, if you don't, maybe you don't like the way you look or you don't like the way things feel particularly, can you find anything you like about that part of your body? Like someone, for example, maybe feels like her bottom is too big or her thighs are too fat or something like that. Well, okay. Are your, are your legs working properly? Do you have, oh, you have legs. Fabulous. Let's start there. Let's be grateful. We have legs. Yay. We've got legs. This is amazing. They're working. Okay, we can walk, we can squat to the toilet, you know, we can get out of bed, legs are working, this is wonderful. Oh my goodness, legs are working if I do choose to do exercise, they're still working, they might be sore, but they're working, right? So finding that gratitude and appreciation for what you do have. And then the second thing, and this is something that I teach to my clients and I'll be teaching in an upcoming course as well, is to to find every opportunity, if some of your goals are related to how you look, to appreciate beauty in others. So every single person that you see that has anything aesthetically pleasing going on, even if it's like, wow, that person's dyed purple hair, or I love that person's eyes, or, oh, that's, you know, that I love that woman's arm. She must be lifting weights, whatever it is, just finding love and appreciation in as many others as possible. And Shining the light back on yourself whenever it feels comfortable, but not forcing it, knowing that when we see beauty around us, it does become easier to see it within ourselves. It's a very good point. Mm -hmm. As long as they're not comparing themselves to the beautiful things they see yeah. in others is Perfect. probably the one little caveat with that. Yeah, definitely. Right. It's, so it's not, oh, I see that this woman has beautiful arms and now I'm going to be crummy to myself about my own arms, it's when I see the beauty around me, I recognize that the beauty around me is possible, which is an indication that it's also possible for me. And I once was told that we can't see something in others if we don't have it within ourselves as well. So true, but it, it can be a mirror. <laughs> mm -hmm. And any other last words that you wanted to speak about? As far as any advice, I think there was one thing, positive and negative, if you remember. Mm, I, th I know for intention. sure. So what what is, yeah, that was what was coming to me, was thinking yeah. that we can't get a positive outcome from a negative intention. And so that's a big part of the philosophy on which my whole organization is built. So while many people come to me because they've reached a fed up point, point of frustration or the situation feels negative, dire, they might be quite frustrated or disgusted with themselves. What we're really looking to do as quickly as possible is to move people toward curiosity and then possibility. Because on a vibrational scale, those are higher vibrating emotions. And so when we start to view our lives as like a blank canvas on which we can paint or a fresh canvas or whatever. And we start to shift toward, I wonder what it might be like to feel even better, to have more energy, to bounce out of bed in the morning. And how could I go about pursuing that versus my pants don't fit. I feel like crap. I don't like anything. <laughs> of course, 
<laughs> we're going to have a better outcome when we're chasing down having more energy and vitality and really liking our lives. So hopefully that makes sense. One of my favorite things in my transformations in my life with having certain fitness goals and actually reaching them were the little daily reminders that you would never think of, which immediately for me, for me was the clothes. Mm -hmm. Every day you have to put your clothes on to get ready for the day. I put on my clothes. I'm like, oh, this is, my arms are bigger. I'm actually fitting this shirt a little better. I'm filling it out more. So that for me personally, that's one of my fa like favorite fulfillments and, and reassurance that it's actually working mm -hmm. in my goals and what I was doing. Cool. And then lastly, tell us who you help, who your target demographic is, who you're trying to connect with or network with or see, or who are the best bits for you as far as clients. Sure. So most of my clients have tried some form of weight reducing program in the past. And for whatever reasons, many of them are done with feeling crummy about themselves. They want to drop the weight. They want to learn how to do it in a way where they can keep it off. They would like to have an experience that feels like a hug rather than a butt kicking. That's, That's awesome. I like, I, yeah. like, like how you put that. I've, I think I've mostly used the pronouns for women. So I, I do almost exclusively work with women, but anyone is welcome. Awesome. And anybody you're trying to network with or in any in that regard? You know, anyone who frequently is hearing about people's weight struggles would be great. Like it would be amazing if I were to connect with some physicians, you know, if, if they were hearing, well, I've gained some weight and I can't figure out why. And, and there's not always a lot of time in a short doctor's appointment for a doctor mm -hmm. to get into the how of some of this stuff. That would be amazing. Massage therapists sometimes hear about these troubles. Hairdressers also hear about these things. But the truth of it is that you know, if we're ever fortunate enough for someone to confide in us to say, I'm not feeling as great about myself as I'd like to, I mean, wow, like that's just a really beautiful gift that someone trusts you enough to share that. So then if you're listening, send them my way because I can help. <laughs> as we've definitely evidenced and uh, delved into to your favorite clients and how they're seeing their successes and why. <laughs> One of the last things before we go, favorite local restaurants here in the Twin Cities. Sure. So there are a few for breakfast. I love the Good Day Cafe in St. Louis Park. It's a gem, gem, many years going there. I'm a huge fan of Wakame in Uptown. Um, mm -hmm. They are delightful. And I love, so Mexican food is actually my favorite type of food. I love Pajarito and there's two locations, one in Edina and one in St. Paul. And they're both wonderful. How's your spicy sauce? That's my first question. Okay. They have, I believe it's nine or 10 different salsas ranging from very mild, very gringo friendly to you will feel it <laughs> going in and coming out. <laughs> you will feel it. A full body experience, uh, for lack of we'll also more detail. Clear your sinuses. <laughs> <laughs> clear all the all, all the fluids out of your body. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And how can everybody contact you on LinkedIn, socials, or email? What, what can you give us? Sure. So LinkedIn, they can find me, Megan Kruger, on Instagram, Megan K Solutions. That's the letter K. And Facebook, Megan Kruger as well. I would love to be connected. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. Before we go, give us one sound bite saying it only takes one. You just want me to say it only takes one? Just yeah, like so that. Just better, better. Better. Yeah. Like for real? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Okay. It only takes one. Amazing. Awesome. So much information and reasons why you are so good at what you do and why I love connecting with you and hearing about your client stories and why I'm so confident in referring people to you in the future. Thank so you. Thank Andy. you again. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And I'll see you soon. Sounds good. <laughs> if you want to guarantee less minister opportunities, then don't subscribe. So hit subscribe. The key to your next career milestone can be a guest any week. Maybe they're in this episode here. Maybe they're in the podcast playlist here. But let's keep kicking open these doors of minister opportunity for you and dance together.